Genesis 13 and verse 5. And Lot, also which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was so great that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? <clears throat> Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. They separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceeded. Let's bow with prayer to you. Father, I humbly ask that which I do not deserve, but that which I desperately need. I need the fresh filling and the sweet anointing of the Holy Ghost. The same one that moved the heart and hand of Moses to write this story for our edification. I pray the Holy Spirit would open up our eyes to see what you would have us to see, would open up our ears to hear from you, not from a man, but from you, our God. That's right. And I pray that our hearts would be open to receive. I pray, Lord, that if there is one here that does not know your Son, Jesus, as Savior, Lord, and God, that this would be the moment, tonight would be the night, and this the very day of salvation. Save them by your grace. Draw them by your mercy. May tonight be a night that some lost sinner gets saved in the glory of Christ. Lord, I pray for that one that is here that really is one of your children, but isn't living for you, isn't living like you, but just might be living like Lot. Speak to them, Lord. Speak to me. Speak to us for the glory of Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we look at this man named Lot, Lot paints a picture for us that is a tragic picture. Lot, for example, paints a painful picture. When we first meet Lot here in the pages of Genesis, he is a very wealthy young man. Like by the tale of bright future in front of him. But when the story concludes tonight and we work our way slowly over to the 19th chapter of this book of Genesis, we will find that Lot has lost it all. He is broke as Job's house cat and he is hiding out in a cave for fear of his own life. Lot presents the painful picture, the collapse of a community, the failure of a father, and the brokenness of a backslider. Lot paints a painful picture. Lot also paints for us a prophetic picture. Jesus said in his Olivet Discourse, for example, in Luke chapter 17, the Savior said, As it was in the days of Lot, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Lot paints for us a painful picture and a prophetic picture, but Lot also paints for us a profitable picture. That is, if we will examine the canvas of Scripture and the portrayal of this man named Lot, tonight I am convinced it will do us some good. In fact, go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. There the Apostle Paul says that stories such as the one we're studying tonight were recorded for us to be an admonition and an example. That is, when we study the characters of the Old Testament, some of them are positive examples. And we need to pray like a Daniel prayed. We need to shun temptation like Brother Joseph. We need to have great faith like Brother Abraham. But every once in a while, the Holy Spirit sees fit to drop into the pages of Holy Scripture what we might call a negative example or a cautionary tale. We ought to avoid the sins of a man like Samson. We ought to stay away from the lifestyle of a man like Achan. We ought to stay away from the terrible decisions and the life choices of a man like Lot. 
Lot paints for us a painful, prophetic, but yet a profitable picture. And tonight we're going to examine that picture with this question in mind. Am I living like Lot? Three simple things that I want to say tonight about this biblical character named Lot. First, I want to introduce him to you. And we notice, first of all, Lot's description. You see, maybe there are a few here tonight not really familiar with the Bible. You might not even be a Christian. We're so thankful that you're here tonight. God bless you for coming. You, you may not know the stories of the Bible. You may be a new Christian. Recently coming to faith in Christ. And you, you've heard of David killing Goliath and Noah building the ark. You may have even heard of Moses parting the Red Sea. But you're not really familiar with this man named Lot. So whether you know him well or you've never even heard of him, let's think about Lot's description. The Bible tells us several things here in Genesis 13, beginning in verse 5. First, it tells us that Lot came from a spiritual family. Lot had a spiritual family. Family. In verse 5, the scripture simply says, And Lot also which went with Abram. Abram was actually Lot's uncle. But for all practical purposes, Lot's father and grandfather having already passed away, Abram, uh, we know him better by his covenantal name, Abraham, takes his nephew under wing, brings him into the household, and Lot is essentially being raised as Abraham's son, though biologically Abram's nephew. Lot came from a spiritual family. I'm trying to see, show you from the beginning that when the family gathered for supper at night, the man that prayed the prayer of blessing over the meal was called the friend of God. He was called the father of the faithful. The man that was Lot's spiritual mentor, if you please, was a man who had mountain-moving faith and was one of the greatest believers in the one true and living God of all time. You see, if Lot and Abram and Sarah had come to town, most of us would want to get their visitation card. It'd be an easy visit to make. They've just moved to the community. They're, they're faithful followers of the one true and living God. Why, he was a deacon over his last church, and Sister Sarah sang in the choir, and Lot was a leader in the youth group. I mean, that's what they would look like if we brought them into our day to day. So right from the beginning, you need to listen very carefully. Just because you come from a great family, just because you belong to a great church, just because your pastor preaches the Word of God and your Sunday school teacher teaches the Word of God, just because you've got a good spiritual background does not immunize you from spiritual failure. I don't care if you're a pastor or a staff member or a deacon or a brand new member of the church. If you go on autopilot spiritually, you will begin to drift away from God and you will find yourself the object and subject of spiritual ruin. I'm trying to say from the beginning, nobody in this building has one thing on, Brother Lot. Lot came from a spiritual family. Lot also had a spectacular fortune. Look at verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now that may not mean very much to us today in our 2016 culture, but could I say it like this? Lot was filthy, stinking rich. Abram would easily be a billionaire by today's standards. And at this point, he has no heirs. At this point, uh, Uncle Abram has, he, he has no descendants. Lot stands as an heir to one of the greatest fortunes in the history of the world. If Lot lived in Lancaster County, South Carolina today, Lot would have a house at the lake, a condo at the beach, a timeshare in the mountain, an RV, a fifth wheel. Lot would have a golf cart. <coughs> Lot would have a full wheel. Lot would have a bass boat. Lot would have a couple of jet skis. Lot would have the keys of the country club. Lot would be the member of the Rotary Club. Lot would have lied by the tape. Lot would have been a member of the country club, the hunting club. Lot might have even been a member of the sounds club for all I know. But I'll tell you this. Lot had plenty of money, and listen to me at the outset of this message. We're going to see in just a moment that it was Lot's lust for land 
His lust for wealth is the hook that the devil set in his jaw and drew him away from the God of his uncle Hayden. I've lived long enough and I've pastored long enough just to be blunt. I've seen some Christians that were better Christians when they were broke. I, I, I'm in my 20th year at my church right now. When I went there, I was 26 years old and uh, my peers, the ones that were in my Sunday school class, were ones that had just graduated from college, were just starting out, and we were all basically on the bottom rung of the ladder in whatever business or profession we were in. And I've watched some of my peers down in Blackshear, Georgia. Brother Jesse, I'm sure y'all don't have any folks like this up here in South Carolina. But down in Blackshear, Georgia, I watched some folks that when they were so broke, they didn't have any money to go do anything, they were able to come to Monday night visitation. They were able to be at a Wednesday night revival service. They wouldn't miss Sunday school for all the tea in China. But all of a sudden, they start getting a little raise. They get a little promotion. They start moving up the ladder a little bit. They get a better shift over at the railroad. Road. They get a better position over at the mill. And all of a sudden now you can't count on them to be faithful to the things of God because now they've got some ching in the pocket, some money in the bank. They've now got a company credit card. They've got the time. They've got the money to keep the roads hot. And they can't serve God anymore because they've taken the blessings of God and have flaunted them in the face of the master. Love had a spiritual fact. Lot had a spectacular fortune. We also need to understand Lot had a saving faith. Lot was a saved man. Now, there's got to be some student of the Bible in the building tonight. You say, Lot? Saved? Old Brother Mike, point of order, Mr. Chairman. I know the story of Lot. I know what happened in those sin sick cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. I know that when the angels of God came to pronounce that judgment was coming, I know that they found Lot living right in there among the thickest thieves, preacher. I, I, I know what Lot did to try to salvage his own reputation within the community, preacher. I know that Brother Lot actually offered two of his chaste virgin daughters to a sexually perverted, riotous mob. You'll never convince me, preacher, somebody might say, that a man can do that and still be Say, well, I could agree with you except for one problem. That's right. The Bible says Lot was saved. That's right. In fact, you don't have to turn over there because it'll probably take most of us a while to find it. But open the little book of 2 Peter, one of the last books of your Bible, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, give us a spiritual description of the man we're studying tonight. And listen to what Simon Peter says. By the way, you do understand the best commentary on the Old Testament is the New Testament. And here in 2 Peter chapter 2, the Scripture says that God delivered just Lot. That word just means justified. God delivered righteous Lot. God delivered holy Lot. God delivered born again Lot. God delivered blood-bought Lot. God delivered saved Lot. And uses him as an example that in the days of judgment to come, if God can save Lot from the coming judgment, being a saved man, God can save born again believers from the coming judgment as well. And if you study 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, you will find that three times in those two verses, the Holy Ghost says that Lot was a just man. Lot was a saved man. Did you, did you get the description of Lot? Great family. Plenty of money. Saved as any man could ever be. And yet we find him as a biblical example of how not to live. Lot's description. Let's think secondly now about Lot's decision. You see, the reason that we know the biblical story of Lot is not primarily because of who he was, but it's because of something he did. Lot came to a fork in the road of life. Some of you may be standing in the center of that fork in the road, even tonight. You remember the story? We read it just a moment ago. God began to bless the flocks and the herds of Abram and of Lot. There began to be an old cattle war, if you please. They were beginning to argue over the green grass, and Abram came up with a very logical solution. Lot, 
our, our servants, our workers, our, our, our co-laborers, they're, they're arguing with one another over who's going to get to eat that little patch of grass. That makes no sense. We've got the whole land now in front of us. We ought to just divide. You pick which way you want to go. You pick to the left, I'll take mine to the right. You pick to the right, and I'll take mine to the left. And Lot made a decision. And ultimately, the Bible says, pitched his tent towards Sodom. I want to just show you tonight very quickly three aspects of that decision. And I'm convinced in a group this size, somebody is right in the midst of making the same kind of decision. And I pray the Holy Ghost of God will snatch you by the neck of the neck and say, you better listen to what that preacher is saying because he's telling you the truth of the Word of God. And if you make the same kind of decision that Lot made, you're going to get the same consequence that Lot had. Three characteristics of this decision. First of all, I see in the Bible that it was a secular decision. Not spiritual, not scriptural, but secular. The Bible says, for example, in verse 10, do you still have your scripture open? In verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes, and beheld all the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. May I remind you, he's kind of in the sheep business. He's got flocks and herds. And he looks down into the well-watered plains of the Jordan. Listen to me, friend. And he's able to overlook all the immorality down in that plain. He's able to overlook all the wickedness down in that sin soil valley because he sees green grass and reckons in his mind that'd be a good place to raise the flocks of grass. He's thinking with a secular mindset. And the Bible actually says that here's why he chose the plain of the Jordan. He says that green grass sort of reminds me of the garden of the Lord and it sort of reminds me of the garden of Egypt. What is the garden of the Lord? Well, Bible scholars are nearly unanimous that when Lot said in his mind that Sodom looks like the garden of the Lord, he is referencing the beauty of the garden of Eden because of the oral traditions and the passing down of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of biblical truth, somebody somewhere along the way had told him what happened back in the days of creation's dawn when God planted this beautiful garden and put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Track with me in your mind what Lot is saying. He says, on one hand, this place looks like the Garden of Eden. On the other hand, it looks like the gardens of Egypt. You would have to understand that in the Bible, Egypt is always a picture of getting away from God. Egypt is a picture of being backslidden. Egypt is a picture of waywardness. Egypt is a picture of straying away from the truth of God's Word. And here Lot says, on one hand, it looks like the place of God's blessing, the garden of Eden. On the other hand, it looks like the place of backsliding, the gardens of Egypt. He's so messed up in his mind, he can't tell the difference anymore between the things of the world and the things of God. When he looks at this place called Sodom, he said, it kind of reminds me of a church house, kind of reminds me of a juke joint, which in many churches you can't tell the difference in them anymore anyway. He says, in essence, she kind of looks like the pure, chaste, holy bride. She kind of looks like the rent by the hour street walking harlot. He can't think right because his mind is so messed up. He can't even tell the difference anymore between the things of God and the things of the world. But I want to ask this simple question tonight. How in the world did Lot know what the gardens of Egypt looked like? Yeah. Well, we find the answer in our Bibles. I hope your scriptures are still open. And look back in chapter 12 and verse 10. If you've got it, say, I've got it. Chapter 12 and verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into where? Into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous <coughs> in the land. And look now in chapter 13 and verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and who? Lot with him. Look right here. I need to explain five something to you. In the Word of God, famine is often a picture, a type, it is symbolic of difficulty, hardship. God in His sovereignty in Abram's life 
in chapter 12 and verse 10, allowed some difficulty to come into his life. And rather than using that difficulty to push him toward God, Abram allowed that difficulty to push him away from God and he started straying from the Lord. I've seen that in my life so many times. I've seen it in my ministry more times than I can count. When a job loss ought to drive somebody to the cross, it pushes them out into the world. When a tragedy in the home, a death in the family, a crisis in the physical body ought to drive someone to their knees and cause them to cling closer to Christ than they ever have before, it will often push them far, far out into the world. And that is exactly what happened in the life of this man acting as Lot's father. A crisis came into his life and he went down into the world. We don't have time to talk about how God brought him back up out of Egypt, but I will simply say this. When Abram went down on that backslidden trip down into Egypt, he took the boy with him. When Abram got right with God, he came back up out of Egypt and brought the boy with him. But here's the tragedy. Mom and Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, listen to the preacher tonight. Here's the tragedy. Daddy got Lot out of Egypt, but he never got Egypt out of Lot. I, I have seen it time and time and time and time again. Moms and dads who are raising their children out in the ways of the world, raising them like carnal pagans, raising them like garden variety heathens. They don't have a love for the things of God. They don't have a love for the people of God. They don't have a love for the house of God. And mom and daddy are living like a bunch of backslidden people who are so lost out in the world that if they are saved, only them and God really know it. And I've seen it happen. Mom and daddy come to a Wednesday night revival service. They're confronted with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They come to an altar of prayer. They get right with God. And oh, thank God in that moment that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. I'm grateful in that moment they find that they confess their sins and Christ is faithful and just to forgive their sin and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. But here is the dark tragedy. They get up from that altar of prayer having come out of the land of spiritual Egypt but they lost their kids in the garden of Sor. I've come tonight to tell at least one mom or one daddy if you raise your kids teaching them by example and by demonstration and by illustration that deer hunting and bass fishing and travel ball and cheerleading competitions are all more important than the things of God. I'm telling you, I've lived long enough to see it. The day will come. You'll pile all those trophies up out in the yard. You pour some gas on them and burn them for one slight chance that your boy would get a heart for God. And the tragedy is far too often. He's turned out exactly the way You've raised him to be. Right. I'll not soon forget the couple that sat in my office wanting to know what I could do to talk to their 17-year-old boy. He got to shoot stuff in his arm, snorting stuff up in his nose, running around with all the immoral girls at the high school. Sad to say, I don't know that their son would have recognized me if he'd met me inside an old-fashioned telephone never once set his foot inside the youth building. We'd sent youth Sunday school teachers over to his house begging him time and time and time again, trying to talk to that mom and daddy about being serious about the things of God. And they asked me, what can you do to help change my boy? I was nice to them. I did not tell them what I wanted to, wanted to tell them what I'm about to tell you. But the most honest answer I could have given them, what can I do for your boy? Absolutely nothing. That's right. That's right. I cannot undo in a 30-minute counseling session what you've been doing for the last 17 years of his life. Lot made a second decision. No, I'm not finished. Lot made a selfish decision. Look, look what the Bible says in verse 11. Then Lot chose him. Uh, now, if you've got a new Bible translation, it kind of bears this out. And, and, and what it means is that Lot chose for himself. He's not concerned about how it's going to affect the family. Not concerned about how it's going to affect the kids. Because of that secular mindset, he's making a selfish decision. His only concern is, is this a good place to raise cattle? He never stops to ask, is this a good place to raise children? All he wants to know is what's in it for me. 
Now, your potential sin might not be that you're neglecting your children, but I've lived long enough to see in my own life all sin is ultimately rooted in pride. I am increasingly convinced that pride is in fact the original sin. It was pride that caused the archangel Lucifer to be lifted up in his spirit against the most high God. It was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of lying that you can see on display in the Garden of Eden. Pride. I'll show you how I believe pride is the root of all sin. Pride is the root cause of greed and covetousness. They got a new house. How come they didn't have a new house? I don't get a new house. I believe pride is the root cause of bitterness and unforgiveness. Can you believe they treated me like that? Now, if they treated Pastor Brad like that, he probably deserved it, not me. <laughs> pride is the root cause of adultery. I'm not here to beat anybody up tonight. I'm trying to teach you something. It's really not rooted in sexual drives or sexual passions. It's ultimately rooted in pride. I mean, I want what I want when I want it, and I want it right now, and I don't care whose life it destroys. I don't care whose marriage it breaks up. This will scratch my itch, ring my bell, float my boat. I want what I want, and I want that. And many people have lost their marriage, not primarily on a bed of passion, but on a bed of pride. A man sat in my office one day. He was about 50 years old. And he came to me and he said, Pastor, I just wanted you to know what's going on in our family. I wanted you to hear it from me. He said, I love my wife, but I'm not in love. And I said to him what I say to everybody who tells me that kind of mess. I said, what's your name? What's well, whose name? The woman you're sleeping with. Oh, preacher, I, oh, don't, don't lie to me. I was born at night, but not last night. I know what causes a man after 30 years of marriage to say, I know I love my wife, but I'm not in love. <laughs> what seems to be the problem? I'll say, I'll describe this for the adults in the room. He says, she's not meeting my needs in love. Y'all follow me? She's let herself go. She's put on a little weight. Now the fact of the matter is, and I'm not trying to be a, I'm not trying to be a kind. Please hear me. He was probably telling the truth. I'd known her for quite a few years. She probably was beginning to let herself go. But I asked that man. I said, well, "Why do you, why do you think she's put on that weight since y'all got married?" You reckon it could be those four children that she's born to you? You reckon she, should, she might put on some weight while she was eating some of those three meals a day that she's been fixing for the last 30 years where you're ungrateful behind? <laughs> and by the way, you want to know what you ought to do? Sir, Have you, you don't need a divorce attorney. Sir, you need a mirror. Have you got to look at yourself lately? Hey! You've got more chins than a Chinese telephone dude. You've got so many rings up around you. You look like you're auditioning for the part of the Michelin Man. Maybe what you need is to go home and get a grip on yourself and realize this life is not designed to revolve around you. Lot's only thinking about himself. Lot makes a secular decision. Lot makes a selfish decision. But in verse 11, we see that Lot made a senseless decision. Crazy as a rain spray roach. <laughs> verse 11, and Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Why do I call this a senseless decision? Because in his pride, in his arrogance, in his convoluted thinking, Lot believes that the blessings that are happening in his life are because of who he is. 
He thinks he can take those blessings with him somewhere else. What he does not know is he's actually being blessed not because of who he is, but because of where he has been and because of who he has been with. The Bible tells us that God promised Abram, I'm going to bless you, son, and I'm going to bless those that bless you, and I'm going to curse those that curse you. Lot was being blessed with all the flocks and herds and tents because he was hanging around the family of faith. How frequently do I see someone begin to stray from God and the first thing they do, they get away from the people of faith and they get out there on their own thinking that the blessings of God are based on who they are, not based on the promises of God and them surrounding themselves with the people of God. I'm telling you tonight one of the best ways that you can make sure that you don't live like Lot and end up like Lot ended up. Really pretty simple. Find yourself a good Bible preaching, Jesus exalting church. You find that pastor, and if you don't have a job in that church, you say to him, Brother Jesse, Brother Rand, Brother Rand, I, there's a proneness in me, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. I need to anchor myself to the house of God and to the people of God so that I may be anchored better to the God of that house. I need you to find me a job. I need you to find me something to do. I'll drive the bus. I'll set up the chairs. I'll work in the nursery. I'll sing in the choir. I'll run the sound. I'll do whatever you need me to do. I've got to, I've got to change my life to the people of God. Come on, man. Come on, man. Lots of description. Lot's decision. Lastly, very quickly, is Lot's devastation. You see, that decision that he made ruined his life. I remember when I was going to preach a revival, pulled up in a church parking lot, very much like this one, small cemetery out in the corner of the parking lot. As I was about to come into the building that night several years ago, my cell phone rang. I looked and it had the name of a church member that had lost his marriage because of immorality. He had not been to church in years. I kept this man's name in my cell phone because when I would scroll through my phone to look for other names, it was a reminder me to pray for him. And over the years, I'd prayed for him dozens of times just as his name would scroll by in my contact list. So I picked up the phone. I called him by name. I'll, I'll, I'll call him Bob. Hey, Bob. Took him by surprise that I knew who was. He said, Pastor, could I come see you tonight? I said, Bob, I'm actually not in town. I'm, I'm up here at Atlanta preaching revival. I'll be back first thing in the morning. He said, can I come see you then? Bob, I'd be happy to see you. Bob, I'm about to go in and preach revival, but could I just ask you tonight, is there some specific way I can pray for you? He said, Preacher, I've lost it. I've lost everything. I said, Bob, let me ask you something. How did it happen? I don't think I'll ever forget what that man said. How did it happen, preacher? I don't rightly know. Well, that's not true, he said. I do know how it happened. Slowly. You see, before I tell you about these steps of devastation that Lot took, I want to give you a word of warning. There will be a tendency for people to come to a Wednesday night revival service like this and say, Oh, I can never end up where Lot ended up. Lot would have never thought so either. And the person in this building, starting with this preacher, that thinks this could never happen to me might be next. That's right. I don't know where you are on this possible journey of devastation, but every one of us need to give very close attention to five simple things, and I'm going to go through them very quickly. The first step in this journey of devastation is that Lot looked at Sodom. In verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld. He just started looking at the ways of the world. Maybe in our day he would be examining the lives of people that have gotten away from God. You know, maybe mom and daddy raised him to be in church all of the time, but now he sees some of his peers getting away from God and not being as faithful to the things of the Lord. And you know what? 
Their life has not been ruined. Their, their life's not been devastated. In fact, I, I saw Bob and Sally at the, at the Walmart the other day, and they were, they were telling me how great their marriage is now. They invited us to come up and join them at the lake one weekend. Why? They're not living the way that I've been living, and things seem to be going all right for them. When that happens, the same thing that happened to Lot can happen to us, and that is we only see the right now. We don't see the stuff that's coming. But here in verse 10, the Holy Spirit drops in a, what I might call a little editorial footnote. Lot opens his eyes, beholds all the plain of the Jordan, that green grass, well watered everywhere, and the Holy Ghost says, by the way, that was before the Lord destroyed Sodom. You see, when you begin to first look at the ways of the world, don't ever forget, are you listening to me? The green grass of Sodom is fertilized by filth. Right. The devil will gladly show you the thrill of this moment and even get you to believe the lie that you have gotten away with getting away from God because the sky didn't fall and your world did not collapse. But God wants us to know that there is an ending to that trail. That pathway leads somewhere and all Lot did was started to look and the Holy Spirit says, Lot, you're not looking with the right eyes. Lift up your eyes. <coughs> Spiritually, that pathway is headed for destruction. But you could have never convinced Lot of that in that moment. He looked. The second thing I noticed in verse 12, Lot not only looked at Sodom, Lot leaned towards Sodom. And Abram dwelled in the tents and dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now you need to go right up here to get this. In my estimation, this is what Lot did. He's living there alongside of the labor. Living along with the family of faith. And he looks out over to the far country, if you please. And all he does, all he does, turns his tent around. Just leaning in that direction. Now if you had come and knocked on the doorway of the tent of Lot at that point and said, Lot, Lot, we were praying for you on Sunday, so we've been missing you the last two weeks. Lot, Lot, it, it seems to me you've got your eye on the side of Lot, you're heading towards Sodom. of Lot, don't do this. I'm convinced Lot would have said, Man, you need to loosen up a little bit. You need to lighten up. I, I've not moved down towards Sodom. I've got no intent. Man, there are wicked folks down there. Don't be so legalistic and narrow-minded. Don't be so rigid. They've got your mind messed up over at the church house. I've not moved anywhere. All, all I did was just turn my tent around. I just want to look at the lights. I want to hear the sounds. I want to, I want to smell the smells wafting up the hillside. Man, you need to get over it. You've become a fanatic. All, all I've done is lean. And in that moment, the insidious seeds of compromise have been sown in Lot's life. Compromise is a word that you don't even hear in most Baptist churches anymore. When a Baptist preacher these days starts preaching on compromise, he'll be called everything but his first name. Compromise. Lot look. Lot lean. Turning over now to chapter 14 and verse 12, I want you to see that Lot lived in Sodom. There was a day that Lot would have never believed he could live in Sodom. But in chapter 14, we read about the battle of some kings. And one king came and conquered the cities of Sodom and took some of the residents of the city of Sodom captive. God uses Uncle Abram to come in and free them and liberate them. But I want you to know, notice what the Bible says in chapter 14 and verse 12. And they took who? Lot. Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom. A moment ago he was a borderline sinner living in a world of compromise. But now Lot is no longer living on the border. Lot has crossed the border. And as my friend
friend and church member said to me, how did it happen? Slow. There are very few men, for example, that wake up happily and faithfully married that end up in the bed of another woman by that nightfall. I'll tell you what tends to happen. Careless look, a lingering touch, an inappropriate comment, a lunch that should have never happened, an out-of-town business meeting, and the trap has been set. Lot looked, he leaned, and before he knew it, he was living among the people of Saul. I want you to notice, fourthly, that Lot led in Saul. Turn over to chapter 19 and verse 1. God has already determined that He is going to send judgment and destruction to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen, and in His grace and mercy, God is going to rescue righteous Lot from the coming judgment. God dispatches two angelic messengers to go tell Lot and his family about the coming of judgment. And I want you to notice where they found Lot. Chapter 19 and verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening, that is at, at evening time. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now sitting in the gate doesn't mean that much to us in our culture, but that was the place where the city elders and the city leaders met. Now, could I baptize this and bring it into 2016 South Carolina? When the angels came to warn Lot about the destruction of Sodom, they found him presiding over the meeting of the county commission. They found Lot as chairman of the Long Range Planning Committee for the local parks and recreation department. They found Lot sitting as the mayor. They found Lot running for state representative. They find Lot living as thick as thieves with the people of Sodom. He looked and he leaned and he lived and now he leads in Sodom. Lot is so connected to the sin of Sodom that in fact, I submit that you don't know your Bible very well if when I say Lot, you don't say Sodom, and when I say Sodom, you don't say Lot. Lot's testimony is connected with Sodom, and I submit to you tonight, you're going to be known for something. You're going to be known as a leader in something and for something. Look right here, I want to show you something. Further in this message, I reference that we know that Lot was saved because of a relatively obscure passage in 2 Peter chapter 2. Do you remember when I showed you that earlier? Talk to me now, we won't get out of here. Am I the same man I got on with? Just kidding, just kidding. Look right here now. We meet Lot way over here in the opening pages of the Bible. Do you see that? We find no evidence whatsoever that he was actually saved until we almost run out of Bible. Scour the pages of Holy Scripture to find some evidence that Lot was saved. Now we do find it. The reason I say that is I'll say this. When I die, I don't want the preacher to have to scour through his Bible trying to find some doctrine, some verse, some principle or precept to try to comfort my wife and my grieving children that, oh yes, it is possible. Oh yes, based on this little verse over here you probably never read before, it is possible that your daddy went to heaven even though he lived the way that he lived. Even though he was known for something totally opposed to the things of Christ. Lot looked and leaned and lived and he led and then lastly Lot lost it some. Still in Genesis chapter 19, there are a trio of things that Lot lost. We know, of course, that Lot lost his wife. 
You know that story, chapter 19, verse 26. She turned back, looked back, and turned into a pillar of salt. A little kid's Sunday school class was teaching on that. Said, you believe that? The little boy said, that's nothing. Yesterday, my mama was driving through the Walmart parking lot. She turned around and turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> Lot lost his wife and she became a pillar of salt. Hang on to that. We're going to, be, we're going to visit her in just a moment. He lost his wife. He lost his wealth. If you study chapter 19 down around verse 30, you're going to find out that Lot, who used to have plenty of money in the bank, bright future life by the tail, is living as broke as broke could be, hiding out in a cave for fear of his own life. Do you not find it instructive that the thing that he turned away from the faith-filled walk in order to pursue the wealth of the world is the very thing that he ended up losing? Yeah. He lost his wife. He lost his wealth. But I believe the most tragic thing that Lot lost, Lot lost his witness. If you read here in chapter 19, you will find that God, through the messengers, the angels, finally got Lot's attention. Lot finally realized he'd been living wrong. And the Bible says that he had some sons-in-law and some daughters that he had raised there in Sodom. And they, they married into the Sodomite community and were living there in the city. Lot did what any father in the building would do. He not only gathers up his family that are living in his house, the ones, the children that are not married, and tells his wife, but he runs across town. Boys! Boys! Open the door! Open the door! God has sent a message. Judgment is coming. Boys, we've got to get right with God. Open the door. Get your things together. Get my daughters. Get my grandchildren. Get, get them. Go, go. We've got to get right with God. Judgment is coming. The Bible says they laughed in his face. I don't know what it sounded like, but it might have sounded like this. Get right with God. <laughs> when did you get religious, Pops? Get right with God. The one you use His name to cuss when you hit your finger with a hammer. Get, get, get right with God. You mean like those magazines you've got hidden out there in the corner of your shop? You mean like those websites you've been visiting? You think we don't know how to track the history on your iPhone? Pop, tell us what about the chicken crossing the road. That's a pretty good one. Because he lost his witness, he ultimately lost his family. So he didn't lose all of his family. I know his wife turned around and became a pillar of salt when he got out of town with those two daughters. <coughs> How shall I say this with children? Those two daughters he got out of town with thought just like the way he raised them. They reasoned in their minds all the men that we know died in the destruction of Sodom. The only way we're ever going to have children let's get daddy drunk. I'll be with them tonight. Tomorrow night you can have your turn. The Bible gives the dark tale of Lot fathering his own grandchildren on a drunken bed of incense. The reason that story is so painful for me is because I, I have two dogs. I have to ask myself, how is it that I would have had to live to have made my two girls ever even think of such a thing? Yeah. Yeah. I believe my friend was right. How did it happen? I believe Locke would say, your friend's right. It happened slowly. How about you, friend? I know the hour's late, but I want to ask you, are you living like Lot? 
You don't have to live like Lot anymore. The good news of the gospel is this. No matter what you've done, where you've been, who you were there with, what y'all did while you were there, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can cleanse you from all sin. This message tonight is in fact a message of God's love for you. A word of warning. to ruin your life. Don't live like that. <coughs> the story is told of two men in a service like this one. The preacher had preached a hard message to the backslider. When the invitation was given, one of them was the first one forward. Came all the way down the aisle. Got on his face in that altar and got right with God. Went back to his buddy on the back road and he could tell his friend was under conviction. He said, I'll, I'll go forward with you. Don't you want to get right with God tonight? And the friend said, No, I, I, I can't go up there. I don't want anybody to think that I, I don't want anybody to know how I've been living. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed. I don't want anybody to know. I, I wonder what they think. Can I just get right with God back here on the back road? His friend said, No, you can't get right with God on the back road. You've got to go forward. Choir sang a little more. The boy still under conviction. His friend said, I'm telling you, I'll go forward with you. He said, No, I don't want anybody to think I've not been right with God. Can't I just get right with God here on the back row? And his friend said, No, you can't get right with God here on the back row. You must go forward. And they sang a little while longer. The conviction really settled in on that other boy. He elbowed his friend. He said, Let me out. I don't care who knows. I don't care what they think. Right. I've got to get right, right. with God. Okay. His friend said, now you can get right with God here on the back row. <laughs> <laughs> not about where you sit. Right. It's about your position with God. I say that to simply say this. I'm not trying to milk an invitation or get you to do anything God's not leading you. But I want to tell you, whether you turn your seat into an altar of prayer or you come publicly to this altar, the most important thing is that we commit ourselves to living clean and holy and pure before our God. Let's bow and pray. As the Holy Spirit used this message.